Good morning. That was not very good. Good morning. Good morning. There you go. And good morning to all those online. We're glad to worship together as we do each week. I call your attention to the announcements. Uh, first of all, we welcome uh, Jeff Hayden, who is filling in today. He's become uh, a fixture here and one of our good friends now. And you see the information in the bulletin about him, his bio, and Jeff, welcome. Also, thanks to Peggy Thompson. Uh, she is filling in for Martha Smith, who was the liturgist today, but Martha uh, has been tested, has tested positive for COVID. So um, we pray for Martha on this day. Also, I want to thank the um, Associate Minister Search Committee. I mentioned this last week, but I want to do it one more time at least. Um, and that is the flowers are in honor of them today. And I want to thank Marley Givens, the chair, Art Dombey, uh, Bob Frederick, Julian McBride and Makisha Spence. Thomas Mitchell will be joining us as our associate on August the 9th. Last week I mentioned August the 1st, but moving details had to be changed a bit. So it'll be August the 9th. So that's just a week from Tuesday. So uh, be aware of his advent and you'll be hearing more about him in the future. There's an introduction of himself in the bulletin and you should have received that by email also this week. You notice the back to school challenge. Uh, if you would like to contribute toward uniforms for kids at Montclair Elementary, we have done other things for them in the past. And you see a suggested donation of $20. Uh, it doesn't have to be that, it can be less, it can be more. And any amount that is above and beyond the cost of the uniforms will go, go to uh, purchase school supplies. So we're worthy cause. Today is the last day to contribute to that, by the way. On August the 7th, uh, we will be packing lunches again for Central Outreach and Advocacy Center that will take place after the 11 o'clock worship service, this worship service. And uh, if you would like to provide sandwiches or other items that are appropriate for lunch bags, you can do that. Lunch and Learn Bible Study is tomorrow at noon, as it is each week. That is by Zoom. Uh, Fellowship of the Great, uh, it will take place. It will not be at Martha and Ron Smith's because of COVID uh, that Martha has, but uh, Linda and David Fink have stepped up for us and we appreciate them for doing that very much. And then on the 6th as well at 7.30, you can go spend some time at Fink's and then rush over 7.30 for the uh, Summer Singers of Atlanta. Uh, Geneva Benoit and Eric Lucas are part of that. You see the information about the, the uh, Women's Daytime Book Group, uh, the virtual prayer event for the Interfaith Children's Movement, and Lena's Place is returning on August the 13th. Uh, that will be at seven o'clock. Uh, my understanding is it's a lot of fun. Uh, I haven't been part of that since I've been here because of COVID, but hopefully we will be able to do that. So stay tuned uh, for Lena's place. And also uh, I was asked to announce this and so I'll just read it to you. This August, which begins tomorrow, uh, Global Ministries of the UCC and the Christian Church Disciples of Christ is hosting its very first Mission Dash. And you're invited to join. You can rock, walk, I'm told. You can roll, you can jog, you can advocate or spiritually sprint, or I guess you can even drive, which is what I have to do. It's a 5K, three miles. Um, Cost is $25 per person to register and it will go toward climate justice. There will be information in the e-news this week about that, how to um, reserve a spot. What did I say, a three? 5K, three miles, 3.1 miles, I think. 
It's a long way. <laughs> I believe that's all I have and that's enough. Uh, the peace of Christ be with you. Let us greet each other in the name of Christ. Will all who are able please rise and join me in the call to worship. Come, let us use our voices to praise God. Let us use our minds to ponder the wondrous deeds of God. To mind God's mighty acts. With all our strength, let us worship God.
you remain standing uh, and join me in the invocation, please. God of life, in you we find our lives. We thank you that you are present with us in this time together. Mold us, shape us, and remake us this morning and every day until we conform to the shape that you call us to take, the shape of love known and shown in Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. Our words for meditation this morning are by Patricia J. Lull. Money is always about more than money. Our spending, our saving, and our general attitude toward material wealth are all invested with emotions and memories. Our capacity to trust in God can deepen only as other matters lessen their grips in our lives. Our scripture for today comes from Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, friend, who sent me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your light, life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. Let us pray. Awaken us, God, with your truth and your love for the world and everything in it. Open our minds and our hearts for the word you have for us today and give us faith to trust you with our lives. 
We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. More than any of the Gospels of the New Testament, Luke addresses the matter of money. Only Luke has this passage that we have heard today. According to Deuteronomy 21 in the Bible, if there were two brothers and there were inheritance to receive, it would be distributed two thirds to the older brother and one third to the younger brother. I'm not sure what they did if there were more than two brothers, but I do know that sisters received nothing. Our reading doesn't tell us for certain, but presumably it was the younger brother who came to Jesus, asking Jesus to, dis to address the dispute between the two brothers. We don't know if the younger brother wasn't receiving his one third or whether he simply thought it was unfair that he was only receiving one third. If that were the case, I would have to agree with him. Many siblings have been divided over the inheritance from parents. Siblings sometimes are alienated over money and property. It's a real shame. It makes you think that it would be better if parents had nothing to give after death. How did Jesus respond to the complaint of the brother? In essence, Jesus said, it's none of my business. Why are you trying to drag me into the middle of this fight? Something that is of no concern to me. Jesus was a smart man to understate the case. He refused to get triangled into this disagreement between the two brothers. We know how it is. Two people are having a disagreement and what do they often do? They don't sit down with each other and have a civil conversation, no. Instead, they bring in a third party trying to get that third party to team with them. Jesus refused to do this. He did not intervene in the dispute, but he did get underneath what was happening in the dispute. He says, be careful about having greed and don't worry about having a lot of possessions. Greed has always been a universal issue. Apparently it was a problem in the early church. We hear about it in the Gospel of Mark. We hear about it in Ephesians and Colossians, 1 Timothy, and we've heard about it in Luke today. In all of these, there is caution about greed. And then in Romans and Colossians, the Apostle Paul says, greed is actually idolatry. I think of Joseph whose story is found in the Bible, the book of Genesis specifically. Joseph advised the Pharaoh in Egypt to store grain because a famine was on the way. On the surface, it may seem as if Joseph, Joseph were being greedy like the farmer. But remember that Joseph was concerned with feeding the citizens of the land. He wasn't counseling Pharaoh to store up for the sake of greed like the farmer in Jesus' parable did. In response to the brother who came to Jesus, Jesus told a parable, which always challenges us to think about what the meaning of the parable is. Jesus was a master storyteller. He told about a rich farmer. By identifying him as rich, we know that he already had a lot, but beyond that, the land produced a bumper crop. He thought, now what am I going to do? My barns aren't large enough to store the surplus. So he decided to build bigger barns. Audrey West says that enough was never enough for the farmer. More was only to be hoarded. And she goes on to say that we hear the message in the media that we ought to have more, spend more, use more. We're encouraged to buy things that we really don't need. Was there anything wrong with what the farmer did? As I've read, there is no indication that he acquired his wealth through graft or theft. There's no indication that he was dishonest 
or did anything unfair or illegal. Jesus says nothing about the mistreatment of workers on his part or any criminal act. It seems that the sun and the soil and the rain joined to make this bumper crop and make this man even more wealthy. He was careful and conservative and it paid off. What did he do wrong? The words that Jesus uses in the parable may tell us a little bit about the problem. Notice what the farmer says. Notice the words that I emphasize. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones and i will store all my grain and my goods and i will say to my soul soul you have ample goods laid up for many years relax eat drink and be merry i just read three verses in our story today and of those three verses, 11 times either the word I or my was used. Perhaps part of what Jesus was emphasizing in this parable was that the farmer was self-absorbed. He didn't think about the needs of others who through no, far, uh, no fault of their own, uh, didn't have the abundance that he did, or perhaps the basic needs weren't even being met. Did you notice the other things that are in the words that I just read? The farmer said that he had ample amount that would last him four years, he said. And in the parable, Jesus says that God said to the farmer, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. Now this is no get right with God because you may die tomorrow and if you do, you're going to hell. But it is a reminder that we are mortal. And in the big picture, our lives are short. I don't know how it is for you, but yesterday I was three years old and my parents, my brother and I moved from Frankfort, Kentucky to Lexington, Kentucky. Yesterday I was seven years old and I participated in my first organized baseball league. Yesterday, I was nine years old and I began to play Little League Baseball. Yesterday, I was 10 and I was having snowball fights with all the kids on the street. Yesterday, I was 11 years old and our family moved to Southern Kentucky. Yesterday, I was 12 and I had my first girlfriend and because she's not tuned in today, I'll tell you her name is Nancy. <laughs> Yesterday I was 13 and I had my first kiss. She's not tuned in either, her name was Elaine. <laughs> Yesterday I graduated from high school. Yesterday I graduated from college. Yesterday I began seminary and I began an internship at my first church. And in that tradition, when you became a minister of a church, you were ordained. So I was 22 years old when I was ordained. I didn't know what I was doing, even though I thought I did. Yesterday, I moved to Atlanta, Georgia to become the senior minister at Central Church. Yesterday, don't worry, I won't go on. What were you doing yesterday? Yes, life is short which is why there is a good reason to commit ourselves to what really matter, and it's not building bigger barns. I think of the words of the country song that the great theologian George Strait sang. I ain't never seen a hearse with a luggage rack. Remember, Jesus told this parable right after the younger brother told Jesus to confront his brother about the family inheritance. So Jesus was saying to the younger brother, even if you have a lot of money and a lot of stuff to go with it, that's not what brings true happiness. 
It was reported yesterday, as some of you may have heard, that someone in Illinois won the Mega Millions Lottery. It was a total of $1.34 billion. That's with a B, billion. I would love to have been the winner of that. As you've probably heard someone say before, I guess you have to play the lottery in order to win it. To win the lottery is not what brings happiness and joy, although I would like to try it out. But we know that it's not what brings real happiness and joy. In the ninth chapter of Luke, Luke quotes Jesus as saying, what does it profit a person if you gain the whole world and forfeit yourself? What brings happiness and joy? The last sentence of today's reading may give us a clue. We might find happiness and joy if we are rich toward God, the text says. What does it mean to be rich toward God? Luke may have in mind what is a consistent theme of scripture. To be rich toward God is to be rich toward others. The parable of the Good Samaritan tells us this, found in Luke chapter 10. The Samaritan in the story not only bandaged a man's wounds, but he took him to an inn and took care of him for a while. Then the Samaritan had to leave for a while, so he gave the innkeeper some money to care for the needs of the man, if that were necessary. And then the Samaritan did even more. He told the innkeeper that when he returned, he would give the innkeeper more if that were necessary. It seems that the farmer in the parable was anything but like the Samaritan. He had no thought of sharing with others. He saw his bumper crop as a dilemma, not as an opportunity to help others. In Luke 3, John the Baptist says, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none and whoever has food must do likewise and in the book of acts we read how the early church was always tending to the needs of others i like what patricia j lowell says i think she's correct her words serve as our words for meditation today the last part of these words say this a capacity to trust God can deepen only as other matters lessen their grip in our lives. Money may be one of those things on which we need to lessen our grip. Some churches need to lessen their hold on money. To be sure we need to be wise in our saving and spending, but Patricia J. Lowell is on target when she asks the rhetorical question, is giving driven by mission or is mission limited by giving? I'll say it again. Is giving driven by mission or is mission limited by giving? Hopefully we can say that giving is driven by mission here at Central. Maybe so.
We come to the time of our pastoral prayer, and I mentioned several. Perhaps you have those you want to mention. Those online, you can go to chat and indicate prayer concerns or joys, and we'll share those as well in a moment. We do remember Martha Smith, as I mentioned in the announcement time. We remember Kim Hollingsworth's sister, who will be having surgery on Tuesday. We continue to remember Evelyn and Bob Brewer, who are recovering from COVID. Are there those in the sanctuary, or is there anyone? Brian? Tell it. That's your aunt? All right. Yes. Diane? Yes. Uh, I'd like to share our, our younger son, Will, the actor singer, is uh, starring in a play that will be at uh, Tucker, in Tucker at Main Street Theater during several weekends in August. So we'll mind and get tickets, and, and he plays a preacher. <laughs> Tell it all. <laughs> Plays a preacher. Yes, Will is in a play for the next several weeks, you say? Yeah. Will help. That's great. Helen? You know, someone asked if uh, my family been impacted by that and they have not been but nonetheless we do pray for all those in eastern kentucky sad situation is there anyone online just one today so far uh maryland for her cousin and her other person lisa also for uh, three and uh what thank you john Let us bow for prayer, a moment of silent prayer after which I will offer the pastoral prayer. Loving God, from the very beginning of life, you have watched over us and guided us in the way we ought to go. You have given us confidence by your presence. We thank you that you are among us today. You have created us and known us in every way. You have given us strength and sustained us. Because we are yours, we are called to be the presence of love but we sometimes fail. Sometimes we also have turned a blind eye to injustice and closed our ears to the crisis and the cries of the oppressed. Forgive us, God, and claim us once more as your precious children. As you have people through the ages, you also call us. Give us the same courage as you empower us to be your voice and presence in our day carrying your message of peace and justice to all the world. Today, we know of those in our church, our families, our community, and the world, some of whom we have named and others who are known to you alone, who find it difficult fully to live into your realm because they're weighed down with infirmities of the body and mind or burdens in their spirits Visit them with your healing grace and restore them. 
God, we also ask you to partner with us in bringing to us the people who need Central and the people whom Central needs so that together we might work fearlessly to fulfill your mission of a peaceful world for all, a world where all are welcome, everyone is loved, and justice prevails. As you would have us answer you, so now answer us as we pray in the name of Jesus, who has taught us our common prayer saying, Heavenly Mother, Heavenly Father, holy and blessed is your true name. We pray for your reign of peace to come. We pray that your goodwill be done. Let heaven and earth become one. Give us this day the bread we need. Give it to those who have none. Let forgiveness flow like a river between us, from each one to each one. Lead us to holy innocence, beyond the evil of our days. Come swiftly, Mother, Father, come. For yours is the power and the glory and the mercy, forever your name is all in one. Amen. Too often, we see the world as a lens, through a lens of scarcity. We look at all the things we do not have and wish for something bigger and better. And yet, our stories of faith tell us that the smallest things often become enormous when placed in God's hands. And so we are invited to bring what we may consider little and watch how God can do great things to bless the world.
Let us pray. Gracious God, with love you formed us in your image. In gratitude for this, we offer you ourselves and all that we have. May these gifts make your love felt in the loneliness of people's lives, in their fear, their grief, and their pain. May your light shine through us that it might point to you for the sake of others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.